Pushkin. Hey there, it's Michael Lewis. Before we get to this episode, I want to let you know that you can listen to each episode of Judging Sam, The Trial of Sam Bankman Freed, ad free by becoming a Pushkin Plus subscriber. And with your subscription, you'll also get exclusive access to ad free and early bingeable podcasts like Paul McCartney's new podcast, McCartney, A Life in Lyrics, Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History, The Happiness Lab from Dr. Laurie Santos, and tons of other top shows from Pushkin. Sign up in Apple Podcasts or at pushkin.fm slash plus. Welcome to Judging Sam, The Trial of Sam Bankman fried I'm Michael Lewis. Court is on a break until Thursday, October 26th, the day we expect the prosecution to rest their case and the defense to begin theirs, possibly even with the beginning of Sam Bankman frieds testimony. I'm here with Rebecca Mermelstein, defense attorney, former prosecutor and partner at O'Melveny & Myers, and also with Lydia Jean Cott, our intrepid courthouse reporter. I should note we're recording this conversation on Monday, October the 23rd. Lydia Jean, I imagine you have some questions you're dying to ask Rebecca, and I understand you might have some for me, too. Where do you want to start? Rebecca, I would actually love to start with you. The sure. prosecution has pretty much wrapped their case, and I wonder from a distance from how you've been watching what stood out to you. I think that um, what stands out is really how overwhelming the evidence is. The prosecution has put on a very strong case. We've talked about before how many cooperating witnesses there are, but you don't know until they testify if they're going to be good witnesses, if they're going to be good at explaining what happened, if they're going to fall apart on cross-examination. And we do know the answer to that now. And I think they were strong witnesses for the government. I think the cross-examination did not, by and large, undermine the core testimony. And so I think the government's done a good job. How do you feel the defense is done? You're now a defense attorney, so you can look at it through that lens. I am. And, and I feel compelled then to preface it by saying this is a really hard case to be the defense attorney in. And so there's only so much they can do. I think from a distance, people often look at a trial and they look at the two sides and you say, well, sort of who's the better lawyer? That's who's winning. But it's not a mock trial exercise. The two sides don't have equal evidence and ammunition. And the defense has to play the cards that they got dealt. And so often the deck is very, very stacked and it's not really a battle of better lawyering. I don't think they're, they've are they really scored a lot of points. Were there points that they could have scored and they haven't scored? It's hard to know from, from this distance if there's more they might have done. But at the end of the day, they haven't really undermined, I think, the core allegations. To me, they haven't suggested that these cooperators are lying. And if these cooperators are telling the truth, he's going to get convicted. So I I think it's not going well for them. One thing that stood out to me a lot about the prosecution is the extent to which they're really telling a story, like to the point where it feels like a movie almost. There was one moment when Nishad Singh, one of the cooperating witnesses, was on the stand and he talked about this heated conversation he had with Sam Bankman Freed when he said he realized that Alameda had taken money from FTX that it couldn't pay back. And this conversation was on the balcony of this penthouse in the Bahamas. And the prosecutors showed a picture of the balcony and in the picture was in the evening. And they had um, Nishad explain where he was standing and like where Sam was. It didn't seem to be part of the legal making of the case, but it did feel like for the screenwriters who were in the courtroom, and I think there were some, they were just handing them a scene on a silver platter. And I wonder what you think about that, Rebecca. Well, I totally agree with you that it's not, that's not a piece of evidence that's important to the key facts of the case, but it really does give you some of the color about being able to think back and sort of think about what it would have been like on this luxurious balcony. And I agree that the prosecution has done a nice job of bringing moments of drama to the trial. People think criminal trials are all going to be a few good men and and big moments, gotcha moments. And really, actually, it's often a slog of evidence that you have to get through. But they have done a nice job of finding those kinds of moments. One I really liked was that the lawyer for FTX was testifying, Mr. Sun, and he was describing a conversation that he had with Sam Bankman fried after um, Apollo had started to ask questions about the missing money. And in Mr. Sun's recitation of it, he says, you know, Sam asked me for explanations, like, what might we say about this? 
And Sun's reaction was, well, like you could try to say this, or you could try to say that, but these are not legitimate explanations. And he was clear with Sam that they're not legitimate. And Sam understood they were not legitimate. And then the prosecution immediately played a clip of Sam Bankman Freed on kind of his post collapse press tour, giving those explanations to a reporter and then turned off the tape, circled back to Sun and said, you know, is that the fake explanation you gave him essentially? You know, yes, no more questions. Um, Prosecutors and all lawyers are thoughtful about trying to end on a note that's really strong. We know just about the way people's minds work, that there's a recency and a primacy, right? The thing that happens first, the thing that happens last, and you want to really nail those moments, and they're doing a great job. You know, you you just answered a question I had after it collapsed and Sam started doing all this media, and the lawyers were saying to me, like, this is just not going to help. And, uh, and, and I kind of thought, like, how could he make it worse? It was so bad already. And I wondered how that that stuff would ever be used. And this was an example, like how it gets used. Yes. I think a lot of us wondered if it would come back to bite him, predicted it would, and and it did. Judging Sam, we'll be right back. Welcome back. What are the arguments for and against him testifying? Arguments against are, are the obvious ones. He has a right to remain silent. People are familiar with that idea from from television, from movies, and he doesn't have any burden of proof. He doesn't have to do anything. And and so what his lawyers are presumably trying to do is poke all kinds of little holes in the government's case to give themselves enough ammunition in closing to say, look, we don't know exactly what happened here, but we don't have to tell you. They failed to do their jobs. That's the story. If he gets up and he puts on an affirmative narrative by telling his own story, then the government gets to poke holes in that story. And even though that doesn't change the presumption, the government keeps its burden of having to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. As a practical matter, my experience is the minute the defense puts on that kind of real affirmative story, you, you lose that presumption. It becomes really a like, well, which one do I like more as between the two? And that's a very bad thing for a defendant. And of course, he's made, as you say, a lot of public statements. The government has a sense of what story he might try to tell. So they're going to be armed and ready if he tells the story he's been telling. And if he tries to tell a different story now, then he has a different problem, which is he's already locked in. He's already committed to what his explanation is in his big press tour. He can't now offer a third explanation because the government's going to come after him with that too. So I think the downside in that respect is obvious in terms of what the risks are to conviction. I think in a case like this where conviction is looking very likely, the other big risk of testifying is pissing off the judge. Yeah, that's what I wonder. Right. About. And this is a judge <laughs> who's been kind of cranky with him for a while. So you don't want to do that. If you testify, And you tell a story that by virtue of its verdict, the jury essentially says it doesn't believe, right? If you get up and you say, I didn't know this was happening, or I knew it, but I didn't understand it, or I thought it was okay, and the jury convicts you anyway, then the jury has more or less said, we think you were lying. And there are specific enhancements at sentencing for having done that. And more than that, you really then have a judge who says, sitting here a year later, after all of this, you're still not sorry. You still haven't accepted responsibility. And that's going to put you really in a very marked difference, I think, to all these cooperators in this case. Because one thing that's really noticeable about these guys is how fast they started cooperating with the government, right? How quickly they came in and said, we did it. It was wrong. We knew it was wrong. And how remorseful they've been on on the stand, I think, how much they've owned that they were wrong and that they knew it was wrong. Not all cooperators are quite as good at that. And so you have everyone else saying, we knew this was no good all along. We're really sorry. And the minute the wall came tumbling down, we tried to accept responsibility. And here you have Sam being a holdout, fighting and fighting and fighting against it. And I think you might see real additional sentence exposure from doing it. So big risk. What's the upside? It's a Hail Mary, right? It's a Hail Mary. Things are not going well. I think if you asked 100 white collar lawyers, 100 are going to tell you, he's going to get convicted. Mm -hmm. And what can you do at this point? The government's proof is in. There's not much you can do left to undermine it. The defense has said they may need a week for their case. So maybe there's evidence I'm not predicting. There there may be things coming. 
But the Hail Mary is you put him on the stand. You either get the jury to believe that he was naive enough or not paying attention enough or sympathetic enough to not have known what was going on. I don't think that's going to be a likely outcome for him. You'll you'll know from knowing him better, Michael, what he's going to seem like on the stand. But I'm not sure he's going to do himself any favors there either. But it's a Hail Mary because there's nothing left to do but that. What do you imagine the effect on his sentence could be if he gets up and he pisses off the judge? It's really hard to quantify. So the sentencing guidelines are a very long and complicated book that provides judges with recommended ranges for sentences for every kind of case. And so for every kind of crime, there's a base number and then there are pluses and minuses. Um, If you sell drugs and you had a gun, that's a plus factor. If you only played a small role, that's a minus factor. And it's an algorithm. It, It pops out a number. And then there's a whole part of the algorithm that relates to people's prior criminal history, which won't be a, won't be relevant here. So as a technical matter, you get a two-point enhancement on that algorithm for having lied. And how much of a bump that is in mathematical months depends on where you started in the analysis. I think because of the loss amount here, the recommended sentence is going to be off the charts anyway. So it won't actually move the needle in terms of what the recommendation is. How much does it move the needle for the judge? It's really hard to say. Very occasionally, judges in imposing sentence will say, I was going to do X, but because of this, I'm going to do Y. You might hear that here. You might not. You know, 12 to 24 months. I'm making it up. No one really knows, but that's my guess. That's what you think it would add. Yeah. But on top of what, 30 years? It is so hard to predict what what yeah. Judge Kaplan is going to do here. I think the the recommended sentence is going to be essentially life because the loss amount's so high. That's not useful to anyone. Right. I think it's going to be between 10 and 25 years. Huh. You've been right about a lot so far. Well, this one's very hard to predict. I've been wrong about sentencing many times in my career. Huh. Michael, I'm curious, as someone who has spent time with Sam Eggman fried what do you think we could expect if he were to take the stand? You know, he's expected to take the stand. I would not be surprised if he changes his mind. I think his lawyers think that the likely effect of taking the stand is not 12 to 24 months, but a lot more. I think they think the judge is just waiting to pounce on that. So he's going to be sitting there thinking, am I going to get 15 years? Am I going to get 40 years? I think they fear that kind of effect. So there's a part of me that thinks if I was a betting man and you gave me the odds right now, and the odds are probably 20 to 1 that he's going to testify, I'd take those. If he takes the stand, you know, it's tricky because because if you look at the whole case, I mean, that, that nobody disputes. Like what they agreed, all agreed was true, was so damning just to start with, right? That all his money was never in FTX. It started out in Alameda. So the funds were mixed all the way back to 2019. The argument's all about when and state of mind. So it seems that the prosecutors and their witnesses have sort of agreed that people really started to wake up to this as a big risk in June when the crypto markets collapsed. And so I think Sam is going to try to tell a story about how out of touch he was from June until November. And it's not going to be believable because he's got all these other people saying, we told him. (laughs) There are a couple things I've learned that have been interesting to me. One was the way he actively avoided the meetings to discuss the subject. Uh, That came up. Nobody made a huge deal about it, but that was interesting to me. Um, And that it was almost like a willful act. I mean, if someone tells you that there's a bug and it looks like we're short $16 billion, but maybe actually know that we're short less than that, you're in that meeting, right? You don't avoid that. Uh, So he just has too much to explain. How he will seem, I bet the jury, after they listen to him for a couple of days, it's not going to change their decision, but it's going to make them feel a little differently about it. They'll see a person. I don't see how they do anything but convict him, but it'll change the tone of the conversation a bit. The whole thing's been riveting to me. Rebecca, it's been interesting to me to watch the way a lawyer tells a story. And it's and also the way the court constrains the story that can be told. Let's say all the money's actually there 
And after he sentenced John Ray says, oh, we found it all. It was all just in these weird accounts in, in, in Asia or, or the things he bought are worth way more. The customers can get all their money back. Now that actually doesn't affect the, the legal outcome, right? Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Uh, however, people, when you tell the story story, people care. That's interesting. So it's not just all stolen and gone. It's there, but that you can't get that in the courtroom. I think you'll hear prosecutors say all the time, thin to win. And what they mean by that is don't take on problems you don't have to take on. Don't prove more right. than you have to. Don't open the door to some sideshow that's going to be a distraction and confuse the jury. And this definitely feels to me like it's in that zone. Who cares? Right? It's still a crime either way. Lots of the money went where it right. wasn't supposed to. Don't sweat right. the, the sort of details. Maybe we'll find out right. the bankruptcy could be relevant at sentencing, right? It'll be interesting to see if at sentencing, assuming there's a conviction, I imagine you'll see an argument which is, look, this was a huge mistake, but at the end of the day, everybody got paid back. Maybe there was, you know, Sam will say, I always thought it was going to work out. The prosecution will say he got really lucky with this completely other thing that he couldn't have predicted was going to save him. But bottom line, sort of everyone got their money back. And so that should be taken into account. I expect you'll see that argument. Yeah. But it doesn't seem like the judge would be that receptive to that argument. I don't think so. Yeah. I think the judge will say, you got lucky and that's great. And I'm glad people got their money back. But what you did, right, had the risk of losing everyone's money and you did it for your own selfish purposes. It didn't care. Right. I got a question, Rebecca, that, that I, it's just been floating around in the back of my mind since all this started. What does it mean to prove intent? Intent to what? intent to misappropriate the funds what what is what do they what intent do they have to prove yeah so it's an intent to defraud under the statute but i think you're right um that here it's really an intent to misappropriate the funds because well i'm i'm certain you'll see this in the jury instructions a standard instruction in a case like this is going to be that it is not a defense if the defendant believed it would all work out in the end right so if you you know, work in a small company and you take money out of petty cash to pay your rent, but you know you're going to be able to pay it back, right? That's still stealing. And that is going to be the instruction you're going to get, I would expect in this case. It doesn't really matter if Sam thought he could work it out in the end, as long as what he was doing was taking customer money that he wasn't authorized to take. Gotcha. So best case scenario, what could Sam say on the stand that would help him? I'm not optimistic there's anything he could say on the stand that would help him. I think that in an ideal world that is really hypothetical, a defendant could be so sympathetic that they could encourage a jury to nullify, right? So in our system, we allow jury nullification. It's a very strange concept. We don't tell the jury they have the right to do this. In fact, if they asked, they would be told that they could not do this. They're instructed they must follow the law, that it is not for them, right? Punishments for the judge, and they have to follow the law. But if a jury nullifies, if after the fact you discover that the jury got in the room and said, oh, yeah, that guy totally did it, but we really don't think this should be even be a crime, right? We think marijuana should be legal, so we're not going to convict him, that there's no recourse for the government. That's it. Double jeopardy and the case is over. So you could imagine a defendant, and I'm, I don't think this is a good case for that, but you can imagine a defendant who is so sympathetic, so young, so naive, so compelling, that even though the jury really thought they had done it, the jury didn't want to convict them. Is that going to happen here? I don't think so, and I'm not sure he has the right personality for that. But best case scenario, a defendant could hope for that. And so if I were his lawyer, I would tell him not to testify. I think it I would understand why someone might feel it was the only alternative, but I don't think he's going to help himself. And there's so much to confront him with. He's made so many public statements um, that I think it'd be a mistake. And I don't think he's going to because I, no one knows. But I think that he has learned his lesson now, that he has seen at the trial the way in which the government has used his words against him. And he's going to he's going to um, decide to sit quietly. But we'll see if he doesn't testify. What will happen? What will the defense do? They may have other witnesses. They've suggested that they do. Many of their experts have been precluded, so I don't know who's left. But you can imagine them calling a few small witnesses or nothing. They'll do nothing. They could offer some documentary evidence if they wanted to, but they could have a very small case. Stick around. Judging Sam will be right back.
Welcome back. Now that your book's been out for a while, has anyone, any characters in the book reached out about either what they're thinking about the trial or the book? Lots. At least 10 FTX people. Most of them, like Zane Tackett or Ram Nicarora or pretty, pr- pretty main characters in the book have reached out to say that it captured the feel of their experience. And I think people like being reminded of why they got charmed into the situation in the first place. Some of these people are still as furious as hell at Sam. And most of the employees of F- at FTX are furious because they went down with him. You know, they, they had all their life savings on the exchange. So this is how they feel. They feel like I imagine the jury will feel if he gets up and talks. They're furious it happened. They're angry with his decision. But towards him mainly, they feel just sadness, a kind of sadness slash pity. It's been kind of interesting. The stuff in the trial uh, has been, the, their details have been riveting to me. You listen to it in one way, Rebecca. I listen to it in another. I'm not actually paying a whole lot of attention to, is he going to be convicted or acquitted? Because I just assumed he was done when it started almost. I mean, the whole thing was a mess from the start. He should never have all the funds in, in Alameda. Put that to one side for a second. All the problems are, are so concentrated in such a short period of time. There are a couple of exceptions, but mostly they're talking about the period from June to November of last year. And watching them talk about it and talk about how they felt about it is so interesting to me because I was with them. And there was no surface indication that anything had changed in their mind, except uh, Nishad had started to talk about we shouldn't spend all this money. Uh, that was the only thing I noticed. And I was interviewing all of them. I mean, not Gary, because Gary didn't speak. If it's true, the story they're telling, and I don't have any reason to doubt the, the veracity of it, how good they were at not seeming like anything had really changed. Uh, and I think the truth is that part of their brains didn't want to believe that anything had really changed. The part of their brains thought this is all going to work out because they'd been through this once with Sam before. Uh, you know, back in 2018, they'd watched this chaos ensue, money be lost, everybody calling him a criminal, and then they find the money. You know, I think they thought, they kind of thought Sam had magical powers. How did it feel for you to be learning that they, it seems like, knew this thing and were acting like it wasn't happening while you were there? So I didn't know what Sam knew, what Sam didn't know. I knew what Sam told people he knew and didn't know. And a couple of things surprised me. The first thing that really surprised me that not all of them knew that, that Nishad doesn't know that till September. It surprised me that Caroline was so insistent about her interactions with Sam because they were busted up in Sam's telling they weren't talking very much. There's none of this stuff comes up in her memos to him. Um, so, so how did I feel about it? It tilted my calculation just a bit towards it's really not likely that he didn't know anything. And the shocker was like the willful, not wanting to be at the meetings, that kind of stuff. That was sort of a tell. Um, I have all kinds of questions about, about the decisions he made. The questions are, all right. So this thing blows up in May or June that the crypto markets collapse and these people who are lending us crypto demand their $8 billion back. And Sam makes the decision to give it to him. And what he's given to him is in effect customer money. Why didn't he just let it go? Like, it's just a crazy decision. It doesn't matter to the lawsuit, but I would like to poke and prod him on that. That is the active decision. There is a moment where he could have just said, we're stiffing these lenders and Alameda's bankrupt, but FTX is fine. And the, I mean, I have theories about, it's sort of the psychology of it. My theory is that it is, his identity was all bound up in being this great trader. And, and it just, it cut, it cut to who he was to let that thing go. And he just couldn't imagine the, the shift in his perception, in the, in the perception of him. I, I think it's interesting that you say that it was, his identity was bound up in, um, being the successful trader. And that's why he made the decision because it also goes to why he went to trial, right? Why why didn't he look for a plea? Now, we don't know that he didn't, but it sounds like there really were never any serious plea negotiations, right? He was never interested. It was clear there was going to be a trial. Correct. Why? He knew what happened, right? He knew 
what Caroline and Nishad and Gary were able to say. And in advance of the trial, he was given all of the, they're called 302s, right? The reports the FBI wrote of the interviews with them. He knew what they were in fact going to say, but he still went to trial. And I think when people do that, it's often this inability to accept the mantle of failure, of embarrassment, of admitting that you knew. It's even in the face of all that, it's easier to be able to maintain to yourself that it's not true. In his case, if you look over his life, he, he preserves a kind of romantic notion of himself in a totally iso- socially isolated situation. And that romantic notion of himself is, is, isn't paid off, isn't confirmed until he collides with Wall Street. And Wall Street says, yes, you're absolutely right. You're a genius. And, uh, and you're, that you're a genius at this, this kind of decision making. And Alameda was home to that kind of decision making. FTX wasn't. I mean, FTX was just a dumb exchange. Uh, it, it was the, the risk taking was all in Alameda. And it, it was such a threat to who he was to have that thing go down. This was fun. This was fun. I have a homework assignment for LJ. What's my assignment? Okay. So it's a maybe an urban legend among trial lawyers, but everyone says that if you look at the jury when they come in with their verdict, because what will happen is at some point, the judge is going to say we have a note or he's going to say we have a verdict. They're going to bring the jury in. And there's someone's going to be the four person. They're going to have an envelope in it. And it's very dramatic, right? They're going to pass it to the judge. He's going to quietly open it. He's going to look down. He's going to read it. Everyone's looking at his face. And he gets to know what the verdict is before everyone else. Then he passes it back to the to the juror. And the juror stands up. And the judge's deputy will say, as to count one, how do you find? And they'll go through each of the counts. Everyone says that if you watch the juror's faces when they come into the courtroom for that, If they look at the defendant, they're going to acquit him. And if they look away, they're going to convict. And I don't think it's true, but I do think you sometimes see what's happening. Sometimes they stare down the defendant in anger, and you can tell that they really sort of are personally angry at him. And sometimes you can't get anything from them. So we're not there yet, but um, I won't be in the courtroom. I'm curious to see what they do when they come in. I will report back. All right, LJ, I will see you on the courthouse steps on Thursday. See you soon. And thank you so much, Rebecca. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. We'll be back in your feed soon with more expert analysis and news from Sam Bankman-Fried's trial. Thanks for listening. Lydia Jean Cott is our court reporter. Catherine Girardeau and Nisha Venkat produced this show. Sophie Crane is our editor. Our music was composed by Matthias Bossi and John Evans of Stellwagen Symphonet. Judging Sam is a production of Pushkin Industries. Got a question or comment for me? There's a website for that, atrpodcast.com. That's atrpodcast.com. To find more Pushkin Podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you'd like to access bonus episodes and listen ad-free, don't forget to sign up for a Pushkin Plus subscription at pushkin.fm slash plus or on our Apple show page.